Breaking news tonight, the Urban County Council has voted to raise Lexington's minimum wage. We have reaction from council chambers. Georgetown police are actively looking for a man who they say is dangerous. What the FBI is saying about some recent threats made by the Islamic State to attack cities in the United States. WKYT News starts now with breaking news. And good evening. After a debate that went on for hours, the Urban County Council tonight approved a proposed ordinance to raise Lexington's minimum wage. It calls for raising minimum wage in increments up to 10.10 an hour by 2018. Garrett Weimer was at tonight's Urban County Council meeting. He joins us live from downtown Lexington with the breaking details. Garrett? It was a vote nearly nine months in the making. No surprise then that a lot of people had a lot to say tonight beforehand. The people that uh, make uh, $7 an hour, $7 to $8 an hour, do not tend to stay in the jobs. People that make, there's kind of a magical number that we see, and that is about uh, the double digit, about $10 an hour. And the other young business people who spoke are very welcome to pay their employees more. There's nobody stopping them but to force people to do it forces them to increase their prices. Council members also had a lot to say. And I've never felt it's appropriate for local government to take this on in our kind of regional economy, and I won't support it. Clerk, if you'll please call the roll. But when it came down to it... The vote reflects passage of the motion. Yes! The vote came about three hours after the meeting started. Almost all of that time focused on minimum wage. Council members say they appreciate the debate over the past few months and that this isn't an easy issue. This is my fifth year on council. This has been the most difficult issue I think we have dealt with. Mayor Jim Gray said he'll sign it because on balance it's the right thing to do. While a local ordinance is not ideal, there is quite simply no hope in the foreseeable future that Congress will do its job on this important issue. Keep in mind, this still might not be the end of the battle. The Kentucky Supreme Court will have to decide whether cities have the authority to set their own minimum wage. That after Louisville became the Commonwealth's first city to do so last year. Live in Lexington, Garrett Weimer, WKYT. Now, here is the schedule of minimum wage increases the ordinance calls for. The wage would go up to $8.20 an hour on July 1st of next year. It would then go up to $9.15 an hour the following July, and finally to $10.10 an hour in July of 2018. Police called a burglary spree that crossed multiple states, including here at Kentucky. But investigators say a police chase in Scott County helped them catch two of three suspects. They say the third man, Kareem Brown, is still on the run tonight. Police say he ran off after the chase ended on Interstate 75. Monique Blair is tracking the investigation tonight in our top story at 11. The chase started in Grant County on I-75. The vehicle clocked going 141 miles per hour. Georgetown police say for 20 miles, the driver, 20-year-old Christopher Wooten, drove erratically, at times nearly striking several police cars. Once in Georgetown, officers were able to stop the vehicle, but the three people inside the car jumped out and ran across all lanes of traffic on 75. One passenger, 19-year-old David Scott, was arrested near mile marker 127. The driver was arrested about an hour later. Now Georgetown police are actively looking for the third suspect who was in that car. His name is Kareem Brown, and he was last seen near mile marker 129 off Interstate 75. Police believe the trio of suspects is responsible for several home burglaries in Berea, Richmond, Lexington, Bourbon County, and in Harrison County. I recently just got my conceal and carry, and I did get it because you never know who is out there nowadays. It's uh, scary, and you, I mean, you could walk up to a random person and not know what their background is. They could be the nicest person in the world, and then they, you turn up your shoulder and they're threatening you or stealing something from you. For the most part, people who live in this area tell me they are aware that a dangerous man is on the run, and they're being extra cautious. I always keep my eyes open. Uh, you know, you got to be aware of where you're at and who's around you and your surroundings. In Georgetown, Monique Blair, WKYT. 
The two suspects arrested last night were wanted out of Ohio for allegedly stealing $10,000 worth of jewelry from a home. He has a long criminal record and he spent time in and out of prison. So why was the man accused of killing a Richmond police officer released on parole just months earlier? Raleigh Sizemore was charged with murder after police say he shot Officer Daniel Ellis earlier this month. As part of a WKYT investigation, we obtained an audio recording of Sizemore's most recent parole hearing in April. At that point, he had served less than three years of a 10 year sentence for making meth and criminal mischief. Members of the parole board questioned if it would be a good decision to let Sizemore out, of, uh, out on parole. But as you'll hear in the recording, the board granted parole anyway after hearing from Sizemore. It's a decision Officer Ellis's brother can't understand. I'm done with this life. Uh, I did everything I do. I get caught for it. And I try to work and I try to do everything I'm supposed to, and I just slip back in every time. We are going to recommend you for parole. Please, 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 Mr. Sizemore, for your sake, you know, let's really put your heart into it this time. We have the result of someone who lost their life because of the failure of the system. And we have to live with it, but we ask that our, our politicians, our state government, to do something about it. In the last five years, the Kentucky Department of Corrections has paroled more than half of offenders before their sentence was complete. It looks like the weather will be calm for Friday, but the weekend will look and feel a lot different. Chief Meteorologist Chris Bailey has an early look at that forecast. Chris? Hi, Sam. Yeah, we're rolling into the overnight and into your Friday on a pretty good weather note. Uh, then we get to Saturday, and it's a storm that last night at this time we were tracking into parts of the Portland, Oregon area that is now crossing into the Rockies. It will emerge into the Plain States on Friday, and it's a big winter storm for areas to our north. This system right now is roughly 1,400 miles away from downtown Lexington, but by the time we get into Saturday, that's not uh, too far away, and it's going to make up a lot of real estate. By the time we get into Saturday, it's going to bring at least the potential for some winter weather. We go into our Saturday cold front blasting across the bluegrass state as we go into Saturday evening. Some rain and snow shower action behind that front as temperatures really plummet on a cold northwesterly wind that settles on in. So we get that big temperature crash that will likely lead to at least the first snowflakes of the season. Nothing uh, in terms of accumulation as of right now that we're expecting. Very cold air, though, will follow that into the day on Sunday. When I come back in just a few minutes, we will talk more about that big area of low pressure, guys, and break it down with the hour by hour forecast. Nations around the world are beefing up security following last Friday's attacks in Paris. In a series of videos, the Islamic State has threatened to attack cities from Rome to Washington. The FBI says it has no credible threats against the U.S., but its director urges Americans to stay on high alert. Kenneth Craig has the latest. The ISIS videos threaten cities including Rome, New York, and Washington. But FBI Director James Comey says Americans should go on with their lives with heightened awareness. Do not let fear become disabling. That is what the terrorists want. Comey says the FBI has dozens of potential ISIS sympathizers under surveillance who are considered high risks for carrying out Paris like attacks. The threat here focuses primarily on troubled souls in America who are being inspired or enabled online to do something violent for ISIL. Here in Paris, the French Prime Minister says France is under a long and permanent threat, warning it is probable there are other extremist cells still active. France has conducted more than 600 raids to break up potential threats. Authorities confirm that Abdelhamid Abu, the mastermind behind the Paris attacks, was killed in a raid Wednesday in Saint Denis. Everyone knows that a new attack could arrive in Paris, and it, even if that guy is dead, and the search is intensifying for 26-year-old Salah Abdeslam, one of the terrorists who got away last Friday. Belgian investigators issued an updated photo of him in a video message on their website, reminding people he should be considered likely armed and extremely dangerous. Kenneth Craig, CBS News, Paris. Authorities in Belgium have been carrying out terror raids. They arrested at least nine people today. Tonight, Governor-elect Matt Bevan is furious over an editorial cartoon in the Lexington Herald-Leader that mentions his adopted children. The cartoon, drawn by Joel Pett, 
shows Bevan hiding under his desk from several pictures with the caption, Sir, they're not terrorists, they're your own adopted kids. The governor elect said the cartoon showed, quote, deplorably racist ideology. But Joel Pett disagrees. The cartoon was not about his children. It was about him and his fear of Syrian refugees. The children were mere props in it, much the same way they were props in his uh, campaign commercials. In a statement, the governor-elect said the tone of racial intolerance he felt the cartoon showed would not be tolerated in his administration. New tonight, the daughter of a man police say was shot by a state police trooper says he did not deserve to die. Last month, police were called to 53-year-old Stephen Brock's Knott County home after they say he made some threats. Police say Brock refused their orders and made an aggressive move, so Trooper Luke Pridemore shot and killed him. But Brock's daughter says he wasn't armed at the time. They never found a gun. He never had a weapon. So it really is a wrongful death, and I really need something to be done about it, and it will. She says her... She says her father did have mental health issues. State police wouldn't comment about her claims. New tonight, police have arrested a tractor trailer driver after a crash on Interstate 75. Police charged 54 year old Richard Van Lannan of Wisconsin with DUI. They say he lost control of his tractor trailer rig this afternoon in the southbound lanes near Williamsburg. They say the truck hit a cable, went into the median, then went back into the southbound lanes and hit an SUV. No injuries were reported. Police say they found prescription medicine and alcohol in the tractor trailer. Tonight, we have learned Caterpillar plans to close its undercarriage components facility in Danville. The company plans to shift production from the plant elsewhere by 2017. The company says this will impact about 75 jobs, but 25 of those will be moved to Illinois. Today, hundreds of people gathered in Allen County for the funeral of a seven year old murder victim. Some people in Scottsville stood along streets as the procession for Gabby Doolin's funeral passed. Police say that someone killed Gabby last weekend after she disappeared from a football game at Allen County Scottsville High School. Police have not made any arrests in the case. New tonight, the Commonwealth Office of Technology is warning state government employees about possible so called social engineering attacks. The office says it's received credible threats to state government resources based on the events in the Middle East. The office warns employees about giving out sensitive information to callers or through email without verifying the source is legitimate. New tonight, Governor elect Matt Bevan has made a change to plans for his inaugural church service. The service, which begins at 8 a.m. on December 8th, has now been moved to the Frankfurt Convention Center and it will now be open to the public. Originally, the service was scheduled to be invitation only at a Frankfurt church, but Governor elect Bevan's transition team said they moved the service after an overwhelming response from the public.